This morning we are going to study a few verses that we find in an Old Testament prophet. I'm referring to Isaiah chapter 24. However, before we open the Word of God, we do want to ask for His presence. And so I invite you to bow your heads with me as we ask for the Lord's blessing. Father in heaven, your people are gathered together in this holy place on your holy Sabbath, and we're about to open your holy book. And we know that we must handle that book with reverence and with care. So we ask, Father, that as we open your holy word, that your Holy Spirit will be with us through the ministry of the angels to give us clarity of thought, to give us willing hearts. And we ask, Lord, that your word will not return unto you void, but that it will accomplish the work for which you sent it. And thank you, Father, for the privilege of coming boldly to your throne, and we know that you have answered our prayer, because we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Some Old Testament scholars have referred to Isaiah chapters 24 through 27 as the little apocalypse of the Old Testament, or the little book of Revelation of the Old Testament. The reason why is because these chapters have many things in common with the book of Revelation. And this morning we are going to take a look at some details that we find in Isaiah chapter 24. Now I'd like to mention that this chapter is really describing the second coming of Christ in power and glory. It is a clear prophecy that we find in the Old Testament about the coming of Jesus, which we believe to be very, very soon. I would like to read uh, verse 1, and then I'm going to jump down to verse 17 so that we can catch the context of this chapter, so that we can see that it is describing a cataclysmic event at the second coming of Christ. In verse 1, we find these words. I'm reading from the New King James Version. Behold, the Lord makes the earth empty and makes it waste, distorts its surface, and scatters abroad its inhabitants. And then I want to read verse 3. The land shall be utterly emptied and utterly plundered, for the Lord has spoken his word. Verse 4, the earth mourns and fades away. The world languishes and fades away. The haughty people of the earth languish. Clearly, a cataclysmic event that is going to totally empty the earth. Now I would like us to go to verse 17, which is the climax of this particular chapter. It's still describing not only the second coming, but it is also describing events during the millennium and also what will happen at the conclusion of the millennium. Verse 17, Fear and the pit and the snare are upon you, O inhabitant of the earth. And it shall be that he who flees from the noise of the fear shall fall into the pit. And he who comes up from the midst of the pit shall be caught in the snare. For the windows from on high are open, and the foundations of the earth are shaken. The earth is violently broken. The earth is split open. The earth is shaken exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard, and shall totter like a hut. Its transgression shall be heavy upon it, and it will fall and not rise again. Can you see the second coming in these verses? Very clearly, it's speaking about a catastrophic, cataclysmic event that will empty the earth and totally destroy it. 
But now I want us to notice verses 21 through 23. Something's going to happen when Jesus comes, and this happens to the earth. In verse 21, it says, It shall come to pass in that day, which day is the chapter describing? The day of the Lord, or the day of the coming of Christ. In that day that the Lord will punish on high the host of the exalted ones. Actually, some versions translate the powers of the air or the powers that are on high. Who would be those? The powers that are on high. Who are the powers that are in high places? It is the devil and his angels. And so it says, It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will punish on high the host of the exalted ones, but not only the powers on high, but also on the earth he will punish what? The kings of the earth. So there are some heavenly beings that will be punished in this day when Jesus comes, and there are some earthly beings that will be punished as well. And I want you to notice what the punishment will be. Verse 22, they will be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit and will be shut up in the what? In the prison. You know, that sounds very, very familiar because in Revelation chapter 20, we find that the wicked die and we're told that at the end of the thousand years, Satan will be released from his prison, the very word that is used. And we know that that means that all of the dead who have been, so to speak, in the jail or in the prison of death will resurrect. And in this way, the wicked will be let out from their prison, and the devil and his angels will also be let out of their prison, because the wicked will now be alive. And now notice once again verse 22. They will be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit. The Bible, the, old, the book of Revelation calls it the abyss, or the bottomless pit. And will be shut up in the prison. Is that the end? No. Notice the last part of the verse. And after many days, they will be punished. Now, wait a minute. I thought they were punished when they were put in prison. Didn't we read that they will be punished by being put in prison? And then it says, after many days, they will be punished. So how many stages of punishment do you have for the powers that are on high and the kings of the earth? Two stages. At the second coming, and then after many days, punished the second stage. Let me ask you, how long are those many days? A thousand years. And then you'll notice in Revelation that after the thousand years, the new Jerusalem is seen. And God is reigning in Jerusalem in the book of Revelation. Notice the same thing in Isaiah chapter 24. It says in verse 23, Then the moon will be disgraced, and the sun ashamed. For the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before his elders gloriously. Amen. Are you understanding this passage? We have events at the second coming, the millennium, and after the millennium. Now, the question is why were the wicked punished and the powers that are on high? Why were the righteous saved from this cataclysmic destruction? Isaiah 24, verses 5 and 6 give us the answer. Let's read Isaiah 24, verses 5 and 6. The wicked did something that led to this destruction. It says in verse 5, The earth mourns and fades away, the world languishes and fades away. The haughty people of the earth languish. And now notice this very important phrase. The earth is also defiled under its inhabitants. Why are the wicked going to be destroyed? Because they what? Because they defile the earth. And now I want you to notice three things that the wicked did to defile the earth. And those are the three things that we're going to focus on in our study. Why did this cataclysm come? Why did, what happens as a result of defiling this earth? Notice, 
They defiled it, first of all, because they have what? Transgressed the laws. Second, they have changed the ordinance. And number three, they have broken the everlasting covenant. So how was the earth defiled by the wicked that led to the destruction that we read about? Three things led to the defilement of the earth. They transgressed the laws, they changed the ordinance, and they broke the everlasting covenant. This defiled the earth, and it's what led to the final destruction of the earth. You say, do we know that that's what led to the destruction? Absolutely. Notice verse 6. Therefore, what does therefore indicate? Based on what's in the previous verse, they transgressed the laws, they changed the ordinance, they broke the everlasting covenant, and now comes the consequences. Therefore, the curse has devoured the earth, and those who dwell in it are what? Desolate. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men are left. Now you say, Pastor Bohr, wait a minute. Aren't all of the wicked destroyed when this takes place? Who are these few men who are left? It's the saved, because the wicked are destroyed. This helps us understand when Jesus says, one will be taken and the other will be left. See, generally we say that the one that is left is the one that's left behind to be destroyed, and the one that's taken is the one that's taken to heaven. But biblically the word left is a remnant word. It refers to those who survive the cataclysm. So the few men that are left are the righteous, because they did not transgress the laws, they did not change the ordinance, and they did not break the everlasting covenant. Are you with me? So, reviewing. This terrible cataclysm is coming. Why? Because the wicked defiled the earth. How did they defile it? They defiled it by transgressing the laws, changing the ordinance, and breaking the everlasting covenant. And for that reason, because they defiled the earth through these three means, the earth was destroyed. Now we need to examine these three parts of Isaiah 24. What is meant by they have transgressed the laws, which leads to the destruction? We need to go to Nehemiah chapter 9 and verses 13 through 15. Nehemiah chapter 9 and verses 13 through 15, where we find what laws this is referring to. Notice Nehemiah 9, verses 13 through 15. Moses, actually Nehemiah is writing, You came down also where? On Mount Sinai, and spoke with them from heaven. What did God speak from heaven? The Ten Commandments. He did not speak the ceremonial laws to the people. He spoke the ceremonial laws to whom? To Moses, and then Moses wrote them. So this has to refer to what? To the Ten Commandments. Notice, and we're going to find proof in the text. You came down also on Mount Sinai and spoke with them from heaven, and gave them just ordinances and true what? Laws, good statutes, and commandments. Now what is this referring to? Notice, you made known to them your what? Your holy Sabbath, and commanded them precepts, statutes, and laws by the hand of Moses, your servant. Now I might say that the word laws that is used here, the word Torah, is used not only for the Ten Commandments, it's also used for the ceremonial laws in the Old Testament. However, in this verse, it, in Isaiah 24, it cannot refer to the ceremonial laws, because the ceremonial laws were nailed to the cross, and God would not punish the wicked at the second coming for violating laws that were nailed to the cross. Are you understanding what I'm saying? 
So these must be laws that are still binding at the second coming of Christ. And so this, ver this passage in Nehemiah 9 verses 13 through 15 is very helpful because it tells us that these are the laws that God spoke and he spoke the Ten Commandments from heaven and the, verse, the verses include also the Holy Sabbath. So the first reason why the earth is defiled and destruction comes is because the inhabitants of the earth have transgressed God's laws. And you say, well, it's plural. Let me say that there are several versions like the Syriac and the Greek translation of the Old Testament as well as the Chaldee that translate in the singular law rather than laws. Now I want you to notice that the New Testament corroborates this idea that in the end time destruction will come because of lawlessness because of transgression of the law. First of all, let me ask you, what is sin? You all know what sin is. Let's read 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. You don't even have to look for it. It says, whoever commits sin also commits what? Lawlessness. And sin is what? We're used to transgression of the law. That's only one Greek word, anomias. Transgression of the law is one Greek word. It's translated here, lawlessness. So if the wicked are destroyed at the second coming for transgressing the laws, what were they doing? They were committing what? Sin. They were breaking God's holy law. Notice Matthew chapter 24 and verse 12. Once again, this is speaking about the end time. You know that Matthew 24 is describing the signs of the second coming of Christ, right? Now notice Matthew chapter 24 verse 12. What's going to happen immediately before the second coming of Christ? The final generation will be a lawless generation. By the way, the work that is used here is also anomias, the same word as 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. It says there in Matthew 24 verse 12, and because a lawlessness will abound, the love of many will what? The love of many will grow cold. What is going to abound shortly before the second coming of Christ? Lawlessness. They have transgressed the laws according to what Isaiah says. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 23 adds its testimony concerning the end time. There's going to be a generation even of Christians who claim to serve Jesus but they are actually transgressors of God's holy law. Notice Matthew chapter 7 and verse 23. This is the climax verse of two previous ones that say, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Let me ask you, are these Christians that are saying, Lord, Lord? They must be, because non-Christians would not say, Lord, Lord, to Jesus. And they're going to say, didn't we prophesy in your name? They're using the name of Jesus. Didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we perform many miracles in your name? And Jesus is going to say, yes, come on, you're mine. No. Notice what he's going to say according to verse 23. And then I will declare to them, these professed Christians, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. There it is again. In the context of the end time, Incidentally, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, where it speaks about the end time antichrist, it is called the mystery of lawlessness. And it's talking about the end time, and we're told that the man of sin, which represents the papacy, will be destroyed by the brightness of Christ's coming because of lawlessness. So Isaiah is explaining that the earth was defiled because of transgression of the law. And because of transgression of the law, destruction came upon this world. Kind of reminds me that in the book of Revelation, we find that there will be a group of people who keep the commandments of God in the end time. And that's repeated in Revelation 12, 17, and also Revelation chapter 14 and verse 12. The end time generation that follows the Lord will be commandment keepers. Those individuals who bring destruction upon the world will be transgressors of God's holy law. 
Notice Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 8. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 8. Once again, the word lawlessness is used, but this time it is used in the context of Jesus Christ. This is a messianic verse. It says there in Hebrews 1 verse 8, But to the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated what? Lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. What does God hate? God hates lawlessness. And he loves what? Righteousness. So are you understanding the first thing that defiles the earth and brings about destruction? It is the transgression of God's holy law, the Ten Commandments. But we have a second reason that is provided. It says there in Isaiah chapter 24 and verse, uh, verse 5 and verse 6 that they changed the what? They changed the ordinance. It's interesting, the word ordinance is in singular. They transgressed the laws, plural, because in the Bible, you know, laws and commandments are used interchangeably. But now it says that they have, that they have changed the ordinance, singular, one ordinance. What does the word change mean? Lest you think it doesn't mean change. In Genesis 31 and verse 7, this word is used to speak about Laban who changed Joseph's salary. Do you remember that story? He was a conniving, nasty guy, that Laban. One of the worst guys that we find in Scripture. He was a cheat. It, it, we also find in Genesis 41 verse 14 that Joseph changed his garments when he was going to meet his brothers. And the Hebrew word, listen carefully now, the Hebrew word change that is used here is translated abolish in Isaiah 2 verse 18 and alter in Leviticus 27 verse 10. Are you starting to catch an interesting picture here? Changed, abolished, altered the ordinance. What does the word ordinance mean? You know, in our way of speaking, you know, ordinance is like a city ordinance. It's something that's really not that important. It's really, you know, it's not even as strong as a law. It's a city ordinance. Like you can't water your lawn certain days. That's a city ordinance. So we say, well, you know, they'll give me a fine if I water my lawn and violate the ordinance. So we think of an ordinance as something that's not really that important or that significant. But in Hebrew, the word ordinance is extremely important. Let me give you the Hebrew definition that is given by the Greek lexicons. Those are like Webster. See, Webster, uh, actually Webster's dictionary is a lexicon. The experts tell you what words mean. Well, there are Hebrew lexicons and Greek lexicons where the experts tell you what the words mean. In one particular lexicon, the theological word book of the Old Testament, this is the definition that is given. Incidentally, the word... Uh, the word uh, for ordinance is chok. You know, kind of that guttural sound that Germans use. Chok. According to this Hebrew scholar, listen carefully. The word chok, or the word ordinance, means to engrave laws upon slabs of stone or metal to set them in a public place. Wow. Wow. Interesting, huh? Another lexicon defines the word as to scratch or engrave, cutting in or engraving on stone. The lexicon Brown, Driver, and Briggs, which is one of the most respected le Hebrew lexicons, defines the word as to cut in, to cut upon, 
to engrave, to inscribe, to trace, or to mark out. Interesting. This word, chok, is used with many decrees that God made at creation which cannot be changed. Let me give you several biblical examples. Proverbs 8 and verse 29, if you go with me. Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 29. Let me ask you, when God created this world, did He set boundaries for the oceans so that they would not go out of their course? God commanded and boundaries were set. That was an ordinance of God. It is a command, in other words, and it has to do with creation. Notice Proverbs chapter 8, verse 29. I'm reading from the NIV because the translation is better. It says, when he gave the sea, it's what? Boundary is the way the New International Version reads. That's the word chok. He gave the sea a boundary. The King James says what? Decree. So that the waters would not overstep his command. And when he marked out the foundations of the earth, does the word ordinance have to do anything with a strict law that God gave at creation in this verse? Absolutely, but there's more. Job 38, verses 8 through 11, once again speaks about something that God established at creation, a command or a decree that he gave at creation. Once again, I'm reading from the NIV, I believe the translation is better. It says, Who shut up the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the womb. That is, that is at creation because the earth was, cre was covered with water, right? When I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness, when I fixed limits, hope, the same word, when I fixed limits for it and set its doors and bars in place, when I said, this far you may come and no further, here is where your proud waves halt. Once again, the word chok is not any little old city ordinance. It has to do with what God established at creation as something that cannot be changed. Notice Psalm 148 and verse 3 and verse 6. Once again, the same word, chok. Psalm 148 and verse 3, and then we'll read verse 6. This is speaking about God setting limits for the sun and the stars, putting them up there and commanding them to stay in their place. That is, until He moves, but moves them at the voice of God at the second coming. It says there in Psalm 148, verse 3, Praise ye Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, all you stars of light. And then we go to verse 6. Praise Him, you highest heavens, and you waters above the skies. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for He commanded, and they were created. He set them in place forever and ever. He gave a what? A hook, a decree that will never pass away. Not any little old city ordinance here. We're talking about something that God has established which is permanent and is given by decree. The rain falls because God gave decree. Job 28, verses 25 and 26. Once again, the word chok is used in the context of what God made a creation. Once again, I'm reading in the NIV. Job 28, 25 and 26. When he established the force of the wind, what did God establish? The force of the wind. And measured out the waters when he made a decree, there's the word chok, for the rain and a path for the thunderstorm. Once again, God establishes certain laws concerning things that He created during creation week. The sun, moon, stars, the limits for the oceans, and here, the wind as well as 
the storms. Notice Jeremiah chapter 5 and verse 24. Jeremiah chapter 5 verse 24. These are the seasons for planting and for harvest that God established. It says there, once again, the NIV, they do not say to themselves, let us fear the Lord our God, who gives autumn and spring rains in season, who assures us of the, and the NIV says the regular, but it's the word chok, the regular weeks of harvest. These were weeks that God established for the harvest. He said this is the time when the harvest is going to take place. The covenant that God gave is also a hook. It is also an everlasting covenant established by God by decree. First Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 17. First Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 17. Here, once again in the NIV, the covenant he made with Abraham, the oath he swore, to Arzik. He confirmed it to Jacob as a chok, as a what? As a decree to Israel as what? An everlasting covenant. And so chok, the word ordinance, refers to something that God set and established which human beings cannot change. But we find in Isaiah chapter 24 that one of the reasons for the destruction of the world and for its defilement is they changed the ordinance. Can we find any other verse in the Bible that speaks about someone changing something having to do with the law? Can you tell me which verse it is? Daniel 7 and verse 25. Speaking about the little horn, who is the same as the man of sin, who is called the man of lawlessness, we are told that this little horn thought that he could change the times and what? And the law. What is it that the papacy claims to have changed, which eventually will bring national ruin upon the United States and ultimately the ruin of the entire world? The Seventh-day Sabbath. Allow me to read you some significant statements from Ellen White. The little lady knew this. This is for those who came to anchor. You go to the Bible then we go to the spirit of prophecy. Or we go to the spirit of prophecy, and then we go where? To the Bible, back and forth. Never stay with Ellen White alone, because she is not the authority. She amplifies and helps us understand and clarifies and corrects us when we go astray, but our source of authority for our teachings is Scripture. Now, let's notice, before right before we read the statements from Ellen White, Exodus 32, 16 and 17. You remember what the word chok means? It means to engrave or to what? To engrave, let's go back to that definition again. It means to scratch or engrave, cutting in or engraving in stone. It means to engrave laws upon slabs of stone or metal to set them in a public place. Why would it be engraved on tables of stone or on metal? Because when you do it on parchment, the parchment deteriorates. But when you put it on metal or you put it on stone, it is permanent. So hook has to do with engraving something on stone. What is it that God engraved on stone? Exodus 32, verses 16 and 17. Now the tablets were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God, what's the next word? Engraved on the tablets. So where must we find the ordinance that God engraved on tablets? We must find it in the commandments. Now I want to read you the statements from Ellen White. See, uh, did you really realize that there, already in the Old Testament it was predicted that 
uh, people would think to change God's ordinance. See, Daniel 7.25 is not the first time. Isaiah 24 explicitly tells us that the destruction comes because people thought that they could change the ordinance. And because they thought, because they transgressed the laws, which we already saw that have to do with the laws on Mount Sinai that are permanent because the laws, ceremonial laws, were nailed to the cross. God would not punish the world for violating those at the second coming. The first statement I want to read is from the book Testimonies on Sexual Behavior, Adultery, and Divorce, page 159. We're going to talk about one law that is uh, being questioned today in the world because it's not only the Sabbath commandment, the devil is softening people up with the marriage commandment first. See, first uh, the legalizing of, of gay marriage, and then it'll be easier to also enforce the Sabbath, the false Sabbath. She says, God gave only one cause why a wife should leave her husband, or the husband leave his wife, which was adultery. Let this ground be prayerfully considered. Now listen carefully. Marriage was from the creation constituted by God as a divine ordinance. Excuse me? What were the two institutions that God established at the beginning? Marriage and the she calls marriage a what? Ordinance. Well, that's just like a city ordinance that we can violate and pay a fine. <laughs> you think? You think God is less offended by people disfiguring marriage and disfiguring the Sabbath? He instituted both at creation, folks. She continues saying. The marriage institution was made in Eden. See, it's one of those hook that God established at the beginning by decree that man cannot change. The Sabbath of the fourth commandment, now notice she goes from marriage to what? To the Sabbath. The Sabbath of the fourth commandment was instituted in Eden when the foundations of the world were laid, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Let, then let this God's institution of marriage stand before you as firm as the Sabbath. Does Chok speak about something that is firm and cannot be moved? What God established at creation? Yes, He established marriage and He established the Sabbath at creation just like He told the waters, you can't go out of your courses, just like He said to the sun and the stars, you've got to stay there where you're at. And man cannot change them. And he told the wind, you blow from west to east. <laughs> because that's the way, you know, wind blows, the, the jet stream. God established that. Here's another one. This is Desire of Ages, 281. Listen carefully. The Sabbath was hallowed at creation. As ordained for man. Where does the word ordain come from? From ordinance, folks. As ordained for man, it had its origin when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Early Writings, page 217. Ellen White states, I was shown that the law of God would stand forever and exist in the new earth to all eternity. So was this a hook? Absolutely. At the creation, when the foundations of the earth were laid, the sons of God looked with admiration upon the work of the Creator, and all the heavenly hosts shouted for joy. It was then that the foundation of the Sabbath was laid. I saw that the Sabbath never will be done away, changed, altered, or abolished. The Sabbath will never be done away, but that the redeemed saints and all the angelic host will observe it in honor of the great Creator to all eternity. Patriarchs and Prophets 111. I'm going to read a few more. Notice what this says. Like the Sabbath, the week originated at creation, and it has been preserved and brought down to us through Bible history. Now notice the next expression. God Himself measured off the first week. That's hoke. See, he, he said to the oceans, I'm measuring this now, you stay right there. 
And you, sun, moon, and stars, you know, I'm marking, you're going to stay up there. And you're going to mark the times and the seasons. Well, God not only marked things, he also marked time, according to this. God himself measured off the first week as a sample for successive weeks to the close of time. Like every other, it consisted of seven literal days. Six days were employed in the work of creation. Upon the seventh, God rested, and he then blessed this day and set it apart as a day of rest for man. In fact, you know, when God put the sun there, and he, could I say he hoped it, <laughs> he put it there and he said, sun, you're going to rule the day, and moon, you're going to rule the night. That's the way I establish it. Well, the interesting thing is that God, when he did that, he also marked the Sabbath. Because the Sabbath is based on the sun, not on the, not on the moon, folks. You'll find people out there that believe that you're supposed to keep a loony solar calendar. And it is loony. <laughs> the Sabbath falls on a different day of the week, every week. Would God make things so complicated for us to keep a so loony solar calendar? Listen, folks, God established the week of seven days, and it's been brought down to us to this day. God has not allowed the weekly cycle to be lost. Now, there might, be, might have been some days that were removed, but the sequence of days was not changed. It remains the same. Volume 3, Selected Messages, 318 and 319. All those who hold the beginning of their confidence firm unto the end will keep the seventh day Sabbath, which comes to us as marked by the sun. Are you understanding what this is saying? God marked the sun at creation so that he could mark the Sabbath as a day of rest. Here's another one, Signs of the Times, September 14, 1882. The creator of the heavens and the earth commanded. See, this is a hook, the divine ordinance. Commanded. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. This command was enforced by the example of its author, proclaimed with his own voice, and placed in the very bosom of the Decalogue engraved in the Decalogue. But the papal power has removed, synonym with changed, has removed this, now listen carefully, has removed this divine ordinance. Did Ellen White know that Isaiah 24 was talking about the ordinance of the Sabbath? She most certainly did. She uses the language. But the papal power has removed this divine ordinance and substituted a day that God has not sanctified and upon which he did not rest. The festival so long adored by heathens as the venerable day of the sun. I'll read one more. Great Controversy 452 and 453. Speaking about the repairing of the, of the breach that was made in the wall. You know, the, the wall is the Ten Commandments and the breach is the Sabbath commandment. She says, the prophet thus points out the ordinance which has been forsaken. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shalt honor him not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words, then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord. This prophecy also applies in our time, Ellen White states. The breach was made in the law of God when the Sabbath was changed. Is that the word that we find in Isaiah 24? Is it the one we find in Daniel chapter 7? Yes. She says, The breach was made in the law of God when the Sabbath was changed by the Roman power. But the time has come for that divine institution to be restored. The breach is to be repaired and the foundation of many generations to be raised up. 
Did Ellen White know what the ordinance referred to? She most certainly did. Now listen to what I'm going to say. It has always been an enigma to me how non-Adventist Christians will fight tooth and nail for traditional marriage. Conservative Christians, mainly from the South, from the Bible, they come out, they say, listen, we cannot have gay marriage. It doesn't mean that we hate gay people. Don't get me wrong. We are to like the sinner. But we are not to like the sin. There's a difference. And somebody said, how can you make a difference between, between uh, the sin and the sinner? The sinner is the one who's sinning. And so once I said to a parent, let me ask you, does your child some, sometimes do things that you hate? And so then there's silence. Well, yeah. Do you hate your child? <laughs> no. You hate what the child does. But you don't hate the child. Jesus Christ died for gay people. He does not approve, uh, approve of gay behavior. But he died to save people who are gay. So don't get me wrong. I'm not speaking badly about gay people. It's about the behavior that I'm referring to. And so evangelicals, you know, and uh, conservative Christians, they say, we need to go out and we need to publicize that marriage has to be saved. It has to be between a man and a woman. And so you ask, why does it have to be between a man and a woman? Well, because God made it that way. And so then my next question is, what else did he make? What other ordinance did he establish? And so then they come back and they say, well, how do you know that the Sabbath today is the same Sabbath of the days of Christ? And I look at them and I say, why do you go to church on Sunday? Say, well, because Jesus resurrected that day. So Jesus resurrected on Sunday, the Sunday you go to church, yes. So if the day you go to church is the day Jesus resurrected, the day before is the same day too. You can't say that Sunday is the same day today as in the days of Christ, but the Sabbath isn't. So then they come back and they say, well, but how do you know that the Sabbath that Jesus kept was the same Sabbath of creation? And my answer is very simple. Jesus created the Sabbath, and he was not going to keep the wrong day. Amen. So we know that the Sabbath today is the same Sabbath of creation. It's the same Sabbath that Jesus kept. And so evangelicals and conservative Christians in order to be consistent, they must restore both. We must restore the ordinance of marriage, and we must restore the ordinance of the Sabbath. Both together, God calls us to, as Christians to do. The final reason that is given for the destruction of the world and for the defilement of the world is they have broken the everlasting covenant. Folks, there is only one everlasting covenant. You know, the formula, the formula of the covenant is, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Are there conditions for being God's people? Yes, there are. Deuteronomy 4, verses 12 and 13. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. Let's see what the covenant is. It says there, and the Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the sound of his words, but saw no form. You only heard a voice. So he declared to you his, what? His covenant, which he commanded you to perform. And what is the covenant? Commanded you to perform, that is what? The Ten Commandments. So what is the covenant? What are the stipulations of the covenant? The Ten Commandments. Well, but the Ten Commandments, they started in the days of Moses, right? Are the Ten Commandments eternal? At least the principles of the Ten Commandments eternal? Absolutely. That is, the Ten Commandments, and he wrote them where? On two tablets of stone. Now, the covenant involves two things, and I'm not going to get into this in detail. We have covenant law, 
and we have covenant sacrifice. Covenant law are the Ten Commandments. Covenant sacrifice comes because we have transgressed the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are eternal. The covenant sacrifices that pointed to Christ come to an end, but the sacrifice of Christ, the meaning, continues even till this day. So we are transgressors of God's law, of God's covenant, and therefore Jesus sheds His blood to satisfy the demands of God's holy law. But does that, does that mean that we don't have to keep God's law? I want you to go with me to Hebrews chapter 8 verses 10 through 12. Hebrews 8, 10 through 12, it's referring back to Mount Sinai, what God wanted to do for His people. Hebrews 8, verses 10 through 12. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. What is the covenant that God is going to make? I will put my what? Is that a word that we found in Isaiah 24? I will put my laws, where? In their mind, and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. That's the covenant formula. What is the condition for God being our God and for us being His people? Having the law written where? In our minds and in our hearts. That's the covenant. Verse 11, none of them shall teach his neighbor, and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For all shall know me. Why? Because the law is written in the heart. All shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. There you have the forgiveness aspect. So in this passage you have two aspects. You have the forgiveness aspect, and you have the writing of the law in the heart aspect. So what happened with individuals at the end of time? They broke the everlasting covenant. Did they have the law written upon the heart? No. Listen folks, when you embrace covenant sacrifice, when you embrace Jesus Christ as your Savior, because you see how much sin cost Him, you hear him crying out in Gethsemane, Father, if this cup can pass from me, let it be so. Nevertheless, not my will be done, but yours. When we see him sweating drops of blood, when we hear him crying out in anguish on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We ask Jesus, why did this happen to you? Why so much agony? And Jesus is going to say, because I was dying for your sins. And when I see that, I'm going to say, Lord, my sins did that to you? Oh, dear Lord, I'm so sorry. And if you're really sorry, you will not want to continue sinning. Are you with me or not? So you have covenant sacrifice that helps you want to have the law of God written on the human heart. Let's read a few verses about the relationship between faith in Christ's sacrifice and works. Because Christians say, oh no, Jesus died on the cross, I'm saved, hallelujah. It doesn't really matter how I live. They don't really understand what sin cost. Notice Isaiah 26, verse 12. In the little apocalypse, this same Isaiah 24 to 27, it says, Lord, you will establish peace for us, for you have also done all our works in us. Who does the works? Do you know what happens when we do the works? That's called legalism. But when the law is written in the heart because we love Jesus, because of what our sins did to Him, God does the works. Because in our heart is written the law. Jesus is found in our hearts. Philippians 2, verses 12 and 13. Philippians 2, verses 12 and 13. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. What are we supposed to do? 
No, work out our own salvation. So you say, see, that's legalism. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Well, let's finish the verse. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do His good pleasure. Why? Because the law is where? The everlasting covenant is in the heart. Notice Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. This comes through time and again. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Christians cannot say, I love Jesus, and continue to love sin. Because sin crucified Jesus. Are you understanding me or not? So we need to go to the cross. To overcome sin, we don't look at the law, we look at Christ. And when we see Christ suffering the, for the transgressions of the law, we'll love the law, and we'll love Jesus. And we will hate sin. Amen. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And people stop there. They say, see, it's not by works. My works don't have anything to do with it. But they forget to read verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created, this is not speaking about the original creation, speaking about creation in redemption, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared for beforehand that we should walk in them. Who does the works? God does. Hebrews chapter 13, 20 and 21. We're almost to the end. Hebrews 13, 20 and 21. Notice once again the everlasting covenant coming through. Now may the God of peace, who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you, notice, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, there you have covenant sacrifice, make you complete in every good work to do His will, working in you what is well-pleasing in His sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Are you catching the picture? So why were the inhabitants of the earth destroyed? Because they broke the everlasting covenant. They did not fully understand the sacrifice that Jesus made. They did not have the law of God in their hearts. Therefore, they did not keep God's commandments as a loving response to Jesus. Now let's bring this to an end by reading Isaiah 26, 1 through 3, and then we'll read Revelation 22, 14 and 15. This is once again in the same context of the little book of Revelation in the book of Isaiah. In that day, this song will be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. What's the name of that city? If he's speaking to Judah, what is the city? Jerusalem. We have a strong city. God will appoint salvation for bulwark, for walls and bulwarks. Now notice. Open the gates that the righteous nation that keeps the truth may enter in. Who enters into the city? A righteous generation that what? Keeps the truth. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is what? stayed on you because he trusts in you. Who are the ones that are going to enter into the strong city? Those that keep what? The truth. Let me ask you, what is truth? The Word of God is truth. What else is truth? His law is truth. What else is truth? Jesus is truth. Our final text, Revelation 22, 14 and 15. Related to what we just read in Isaiah 26. Blessed are those who do His commandments. I'm reading from the King James, which I believe to be the correct translation. Blessed are those who do His commandments. That would be the same as keeping the truth in Isaiah. That they might have the right to the tree of life, and may what? Enter through the gates into the city. Any relationship with Isaiah 26? Absolutely. Who are the ones outside? 
But outside are dogs. I'm not talking literally about dogs. Don't worry, there will be dogs in the kingdom. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers. And I do, are these all violations of the Ten Commandments? Murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. Those are the ones who are outside. The ones who are allowed through the gates into the city are commandment keepers because they have the law of God written in the heart. Great peace have those who love thy law is what David said in Psalm 119. Folks, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 gives us the secret. By beholding, we are changed. If we're beholding Jesus Christ, his suffering, his death, the horrendous nature of sin, we will long to be more like him. If we're committing to our minds things that confirm and strengthen sin, we will be alienated from Jesus Christ. And there's a certain sense in which having the law written in the heart is the same as having Jesus in our hearts because the law is a written transcription of the character of Christ. Amen. May God bless us and keep us and may God lead us to dedicate our time and our concentration on the things that will build our character and that will make us more like Jesus. So that we are not among that group that are mentioned in Isaiah chapter 24, who have changed the ordinance, have transgressed the laws, and have broken the everlasting covenant. So that we can say, by the way, this is in Isaiah, the little apocalypse, lo, this is our God, we have waited for him, and he will save us. Father in heaven, thank you for being with us in our study today. We ask that you will help us to present this message to the world. The Christian world needs to hear this, and we need to apply it to our own personal lives. I ask, Lord, that you will give us the strength and the determination through your divine power to develop the character that will be stayed on thee. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer. We ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.